Well, we're glad you're here and glad for all those that are online as well. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion to study God's Word this evening. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming any unconfessed sins to God the Father, which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, this is another day that you show your faithfulness, your strength, your power. The days are much easier when we remember that it's all about you, not about us. And however, you are not only mindful of us, you love us, you protect us, you provide us, you teach us, you're our all in all. We have the high privilege of being here to study your word so that we can even do a better job of being servants on your behalf. What an honor it is to be your servant. As the world continues to spin out of control and fall apart, people are full of hate, they're full of bitterness, they're full of fear. But it doesn't have to be that way, and we're just so thankful that we have the doctrine, we have that sense of eternal destiny. We have so much. And you continue to bless and provide for us. We're so thankful. We love you for who you are and what you do and what you're going to do. We pray for our country that uh, it's not over yet. We pray for our president that you will protect him, humble him, help him to search you for the way to go, that you'll guide him and help him, and that you'll help believers that they won't give up, that they won't fall apart. This is, this is what we prepare for. It's like the military who train and train and train, and then when they get into battle, they're ready to go. Well, this is the battle, and we are ready to go. We're ready to go because we're not depending on ourselves. We're depending on the doctrine that we have in us to recognize that it's always powerful because it rests on the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to go back to Romans this evening, but I'm going to surprise somebody. Barbara, would you like to come read your, your poem to everyone? I've got the microphone ready. When did you write this? Today. Today. Will it all be fresh in your mind? Oh, dear. Here you go. You, you can stand anywhere you want to. You, have, you want to hold this? You want me, to, want me to hold it for you? I need to get up. It'd be a good idea. Okay, yeah, if you get here, you won't have to hold it. She wants to hide. Get way over here. Over here. There you go. All right. Don't be nervous. There's only about a thousand people watching. This is called, pardon me? This poem is called America in Crisis. I was taught as a child to honor our flag. Today I'm amazed at those who burn it as a discarded old rag. What is different in my country than when I was young? Where did this new set of values come from? God gave us the equipment for success in earthly life, but ignoring his word will bring ultimate strife. We have infinite choices to make every day. Americans' bad choices cause our country to pay. Our divided country is a clear fact to sight. Have we come too far to even judge what is right? Truth to many is whatever I say today. Here a truth, there a truth. Any truth is okay. We reside at a crossroads our country must heed. Whatever feels good is America's new creed. 
It is already, is it already too late to turn things around? Maybe not. The Bible is where the answer is found. Remember, dear ones, Christ is still on the throne. And whatever may, and whatever may come, we are never alone. Y'all got to tell me when you don't hear me. Okay. Full of envy is where we're beginning tonight. The Greek word is pathanos. That's P-H-T-H-O-N-O-S. It's a noun, genitive, singular, masculine. And it means to means envy or jealousy. Envy and jealousy are very close, but as we go through this, I'm going to show you the difference between the word jealousy and envy. There is a difference. Envy is not a topic of any significance in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. Envy is the peculiar fault of the devil since it was envy that brought about his fall and it was his envy that caused man's fall. And then you have a number here. I don't like these glasses. I can't see from them very good. Fortunately, I have about 10 more pair up here. I'm not exaggerating. I don't like those either. No, I got plenty more. Okay, that's better. So envy isn't a big deal in Scripture necessarily. Not as much as some others, maybe. But it is important because it is the motivation behind Satan's fall, and it's the motivation behind man's fall as well. So that means it's got power. It is the antithesis of loving our enemies, since the 
envious man will hate even a friend if, if that friend is fortunate. And that is unfortunate that that happens. We have something of a paradox. Envy plays little part in the Bible, but is a key concept in developed Christian theology. Painful or resentment awareness of another's advantage joined with the desire to possess the same advantage. That is definition, one of the definitions of envy. You know, every time someone that we know, it may be a family member, it may be a church member, or maybe even just uh, someone that we don't know that well, acquaintance, and we hear that their ship came in. We hear that they won the lottery or something really good happens or, or they did something and everybody is applauding them. And there are people that rather than applauding them and being thankful that they are doing well, they, their en envy of them causes them to want to bring them down. They think to themselves, well, I'm as good as that person is. Why, do, why does he have all that? Why, why isn't some of that coming to me? And those, that's a poison that starts taking hold of your soul. And it, it, it just is devastating. We should, be, we should rejoice with those who rejoice and celebrate with those who celebrate. And there are people who will do that on the outside, but on the inside, they're resentful that this person made it and they haven't. That this is what envy is, and it's very powerful. Genesis 37 4 says, and his, referring to Joseph's brother, saw their father loved him more than all his brothers. So they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. I touched on this, I think it was last Sunday, that his brothers knew that Joseph was Jacob, or I should say Israel's favorite. Made a coat of many colors. And Joseph had a dream, and he was not wise enough to keep it to himself. And he told his brothers about the dream that he had ascendancy and they were all lesser than him. And he had that coat and they hated him. It's one thing to not care for somebody, but you're kin to him. It's quite another to plot his death. And that's what they were doing. You see how, and jealousy is a part of that also. But you see how powerful these are? There's not a lot of ink spilled in the Bible about this, but when you have envy or jealousy, you, you don't have a spiritual life. You have to get rid of that. And you know, by confessing it, asking for help. Proverbs 14.30 Sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. And only you know, unless it gets to critical mass, if you're envious or not, whether you're jealous or not. Sometimes people will put out a little, little innuendo, just a little phrase that might lower the curtain to expose a bit of their envy or jealousy. Sometimes it's done in jest, but not always is it jest. Sometimes there's something behind that. Galatians 5.26 Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Uh, can that happen in churches? <laughs> Silly question, isn't it? You know, we are so fortunate. I, I hear all the time, and you may hear them as well, churches breaking up and there's strife and schisms and sex and uh, people who, just like this, they challenge one another, they envy one another, and nobody's happy. 
I'm so thankful for Country Bible Church and for the people who are really hungry for His Word and they are not just here to warm a seat. They're here to grow and learn and it shows. Envy is a noun and it covers spite and resentment towards the success or possessions of another. It can be innocuous. You might have met someone and they invite you over to the house. You don't know that much about them. And you think they probably live in a house similar to yours and you go there and it's a mansion. And as you go through, it's just, you're blown away by all the wonderful things they have. Very expensive. Everything is so nice. And rather than appreciate it and be so glad that they have these things, you start to have the little poison start seeping through. Well, why do they have that? You need to nip that in the bud as soon as that comes open. If you start going there, just shut it down because it can fester. There's been a lot of killings over envy and jealousy. So, here's the difference. Envy is spite and resentment towards the success or possessions of another. Jealousy, both of these are nouns, by the way, is a greedy or prideful longing for something that belongs to another, even something intangible such as a skill. Jealousy is a greed or a pride, a prideful longing for something that belongs to someone else. And envy is a state of spite or resentment towards the success of others. You don't necessarily want to have what they have, but you resent that they have it. Envy is to be distinguished from jealousy. We are jealousy, excuse me, we are jealous of our own. We are envious of another man's possessions. Jealousy fears to lose what it has. Envy is pained at seeing another, another have. Another's, I guess it should be another one's have, what they have. So that's the difference between envy and jealousy. I'll give you that one more time. Now, it reads a little coarse towards the bottom. That's, that's the way it came across. But it's not that way off. We can still understand it. So envy is to be distinguished from jealousy. We are jealous for our own. For instance, if you're married and you have a, a husband or a wife and you, you think that um, they may be a little too friendly to someone else, you might uh, start being jealous of that. We are jealous for what we own or what is ours. By the way, if that happens, what's the best way to do? What, what's the best thing to do? If you, if, if, it doesn't have to be a marriage. It could be a friend. It could be anybody. But if you start having this sensation, this is starting to bother me. They're getting a little bit too chummy. And it doesn't even have to be a man, a, a, somebody of the opposite sex. It could be another man that just two men together and they're having fun. They go fishing. They, they go hunting and they go all these places and their wife is left out. The wife can get jealous of another man and vice versa. So what do you do in a case like that? It's bothering you. Are you to just stuff it? Yeah, you can confess it and move on, and that's true. But you still have to deal with the fallout that is happening right then. Because your spouse doesn't know that, or your friend, or whoever it may be. So I think the best thing to do is to go to whoever it is that you're jealous, is jealous of and say, I need to tell you something. Just talk to him and say, this is bothering me. And explain why. I, I just feel like I'm not even important. Uh, you, you don't even seem like you care whether I live or die. I'm not even here. What it, express it in some way so that they will know it. That's called communication. And so many times it's not done because it could be un, unpleasant. But those are the times that we need to communicate the most. And I'm not talking going to them and start screaming and start judging and 
threaten and all that kind of stuff. Just tell them how you feel, what is bothering you. It's coming between us in our relationship. It has to be brought up and discussed. I think that's what should happen in that situation, and you don't know how they're going to react. You hope, and I think most of the time, that they say, I didn't know that was the case. And you're wrong about me not caring for you. And I didn't think of it in terms that I have this new friend or whoever it may be and we really have a good time. But I didn't think about what it was doing to you. And of course, you're a million times more important than they are, so I'll keep that in mind uh, when I get offers to be with this person more. I, if nothing else, I'll just tell them I have to spend more time with my, No, I don't have to. I want to spend more time with my wife. That's the... What is with that tonight? It's the third time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I just want to bring that out because it's one thing to... When you talk about jealousy and see the power that it has, but it's another thing to just think it through what to do. So if you do go to your friend or your spouse, whoever it is, and you you just bury yourself... That's why people don't want to do it, because they don't... When you go to a friend and you are just absolutely truthful, then you're vulnerable, and we don't like to be vulnerable. We much rather just stuff it in and let it grow and get worse and start getting to a point where we hate them, and they don't even know why. But what if you go and you say this to them, and they say, well, you just think too much of yourself. You just need to get over it. Something along those lines. That's another kind of test, isn't it? Most people think, okay, that gives me the right to wage war now. I mean, that's what some people think. I just thought I would stop here and bring this out because this isn't just words on a page. This isn't just innocuous things that we're talking about. These are very real. We're talking about being either uh, jealous or, or envious of someone, and it has dark consequences, and we're not just rushing through this so we can say, oh, yeah, we studied that. We need to think about what, we, what do we do in these situations. So there you, got the, you have the difference between envy and jealousy. For one man who sincerely pities our misfortunes, there are a thousand who secretly hate our successes. This was Charles C. Colton. I don't know who he is, but he was a wise man. This is another saying. Envy shoots at others and wounds itself. That was unknown who said that, but another wise statement. The man who keeps busy helping the man below him will have time to envy the man above him. And there may not be anybody above him anyway. And that was by Harriet C. Mears, Henrietta. I'd like to talk to her. She's like a wise woman. In the days of the Crusades, Richard of England and Philip of France went to battle as comrades. When both men came under fire in the Holy Land, it was evident that Richard was the braver of the two. The Crusaders named him Richard the Lionhearted. When it became obvious that the Crusaders regarded Richard as their chief, Philip grew envious, moved by jealousy. He objected to Richard's strategies. He finally became defiant, withdrew from Palestine in a huff, and hastened back to France. Later, Philip treacherous, treacherously invaded Richard's territory. What a tragedy. And where did it start? Envy. They were on the same side. They knew each other. They were friends. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy 
and envy and all slander like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word <clears throat> that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Let's, let's, let's dissect this just a moment. Look at it a little closer. We start out with it saying, put aside all malice and guile, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. That is not a command. It's a participle. It ends on ing. Putting aside. So even though it's not a command, it's still saying put aside these sins. So I'm asking you, how do we do that? It says put aside these things. Malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. How do we do that? Anybody got an idea? None? Well, let's go back a little bit. Do we have the power to put them away? Well, I'll answer that with another question. Does the Holy Spirit indwell us? Do we have the availability of the power to operate on the power of the Holy Spirit? Is that getting us closer to what we can do? I think the first thing is to figure out or to recognize that we do have malice and guile or hypocrisy, envy and slander. You can't fix something unless you know it's broke, right? And sometimes we don't see it. It's amazing. It can, it can be something that everybody else sees in us, a foible, something that is not exactly right, but we can't see it. So when someone comes to us and is going to impart that knowledge to us, that we, let's, take, let's just take one, um, let's say hypocrisy. Then you have a way uh, of being hypocritical. How do, you, how do you go to someone and address that issue when they don't even know they have it? Very carefully. <laughs> Very carefully. How do you know when to do that? I think the when is when it is affecting you to the point to where your relationship with that person is not where it should be. I think that's the point you need to go and say, hey, we need to talk. And when you do that, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you're not criticizing them, that you're not trying to show in any way that you're better than them, the best way to start out is, be, is by saying, I'm a no good sinner that is so full of sin that there's so many sins that I'm guilty of, and I don't even know what they are because I'm such a sinful person. Let's start with that. But something has come up that I have to talk about. It, 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 it bothers me. It's not that I'm trying to judge you, but it's coming in, 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 as a something to divide us. It's, it's hurting our relationship. And then you just have to tell them what it is. Does that sound plausible to you? What I'm trying to do is when we go over these verses, I just don't want to read the verses and go on. Because when it says, therefore putting aside all, and then it has all these sins, maybe we ought to look about how do you do that? In Matthew chapter 18, it talks about going to a brother and addressing things like that. And we need to do it. And pray about it. Pray before you talk to someone like that. And be as humble as you possibly can. But don't stuff it. 
In other words, don't ignore it and sweep it under the rug because it's not going to get better. Most of the time it's not. It's going to be much worse. You might as well handle it now. And if your friend or whoever it may be, a man, family member, is worth their salt, they'll recognize that you love them enough to do something that is hard to do, maybe even unpleasant, because you care enough for, for them to do it. You might even tell them that if they don't know it. So we'll move on. I just want to stop there. And this is how we need to read the Bible. It's not how many... So, you know, I know that there's... Read the Bible in a year and you can't read one chapter or whatever we're doing. And, and that's fine. It never worked out well for me because I get to a verse like this and it says, put aside all malice. And I think, now, what, what, what is it talking about? How do you do that? And time is passing. And then I'll read the rest of the chapter. I don't even know what it was talking about because I'm still back here thinking about this. How do I put aside? Verse 2, like newborn babes, we long for the pure milk of the word. Hopefully, you're not longing for the pure milk of the word because I don't think y'all are milk drinkers anymore. It'd be like in a western, some rough, tough cowboy goes up to the bar and says, give me a milk. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? But that's how we start. That by it, the pure milk of the word, you may grow. You see that? See, when you slow down and start looking at it, it tells you how you're going to grow. It's the only way to grow. In respect to salvation. All right, let's look at that. What can we do? What works can we do? How much doctrine does it take to grow in respect to our salvation. And if you make that eternal salvation, it's pretty silly, isn't it? Do we have to grow in respect to our salvation? Can we grow that? Can we make it bigger or more? In our language, this would be a lot more clear if it said, and this is in the realm of its definition, is to be delivered. If it said that you may grow in respect to deliverance, wouldn't that be more? Because there's so many people, they see that word salvation, oh, oh, oh well, that's talking about going to hell or heaven. No, that's experiential. That you may grow in respect to deliverance from your life crashing on the rocks because you have no doctrine. Why? Yes. Yeah. Norman well, Vincent Peale in his idea of power of positive thinking leaves out this part of longing for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow well, <laughs> well I take it back he does talk about it being the word but it's his word and his books that's what he wants you to which is pablum it's not true. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Okay, I just wanted to go through that slowly and let it sink in because it's a very powerful verse. And that salvation part, probably I would say 85 to 90% of the people, I'm talking about believers when they read that, they're thinking it's going to make their salvation stronger. They can really feel like they're saved now because they're studying the Word. It's too bad. Early Protestant creeds unanimously called the Pope Antichrist. Now this came from the Berlin call, and Dave Hunt was famous for calling a spade a spade. And he was always exposing the underbelly of the Catholic Church, and that's very easy to do. But he didn't do it just to embarrass them, he did it to inform them. And so our we just came back from last Tuesday studying about evil. And so I thought this would be good. I have it in red here. 
about evil, and he's connecting it, connecting it to the popes. And all he's doing is giving recorded history here. Again, early Protestant creeds unanimously call the pope Antichrist, not only because of the Ro Rome's heresies, but because the lives of many popes exemplified Antichrist's evil. That's a strong statement, isn't it? More than one pope vacated Peter's throne, in quotations, when killed by a furious husband who caught him in bed with his wife. More than one, it says. Even Catholic historians admit that many of the popes were among the most inhuman monsters to walk on this earth. In Vicars of Christ, Jesuit Peter de Rosa reminds us that pope after pope engaged habitually on a grand scale in wholesale mayhem and murder, pillage, rape, incest, simony, and corruption of the worst sort. <laughs> it, yeah, it means uh, to sell or buy uh, offices in the church or to sell or buy, um, well, something like indulgences, that type of thing in the church. Their evil lives are a blot upon the pages of history. It is a travesty to refer to such shameless perverts and master criminals as His Holiness or Vicar of Christ as they all are in official Roman Catholic dogma and documents. I, when I put this in the notes today, I was talking to Carrie, and I, I said, there's over a billion Catholics. Let's just round it off and say maybe a fourth or maybe a less of the world are Catholics. They can read this just like we can. They probably have read it or someone has told them these things. And I believe it because in my lifetime, look at all the lawsuits of pederasty and the cover-up of it in the Catholic Church. We're talking about massive, horrible things like that. Did their numbers go down? Not in the slightest. How could you go to a church and worship if it was suspect whether the priest was one of that number or one of them that was covering it up? How can a person like that be a spiritual leader? I don't get it, but that's just the way it is. That's what I thought. <clears throat> this is mild to compare to some of the... Uh, in Dave Hunt has several articles like this. There, do you know there was times that there were more than one person declaring to be popes at the same time? And they went to war towards each other. And it, oh, it's a mess. Anyway, thank you, Lord, that your book is your word is true. Now we go to murder. Biggie. The Greek word for murder is phonos. P h o n o s. That's a genitive singular masculine noun. Murder is willful. Willful murder was distinguished from accidental homicide and was invariably visited with capital punishment. Here are some verses if you want to jot them down. Numbers chapter 35, verse 16 and 18. 21 and 31. These are all in Numbers 35. In Numbers 35, verse 16, 18, 21, and 31 is talking about the legitimacy of capital punishment. Le Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17 as well. This law is in principle, this law in its principle is founded on the fact of man's having been made in the likeness of God. 
Genesis 9, 5, and 6. John 8, 44. 1 John 3, 12. And 1 John 3, 15. That's what makes it so heinous, is man was created in the likeness of God, and no one other than God has the right to take someone with being mindful of a few exemptions that we'll look at. The Mosaic Law prohibited any compensation for murder or the reprieve of the murderer. In other words, you couldn't buy them out. And you couldn't reprieve them either in most cases. Exodus 21.12, this is explaining the verses that handle this. Exodus 21.12 and 14, Deuteronomy 19.11 and 13, 2 Samuel 17.25 and 2 Samuel 20.10. I'll go over that one more time. This is about the prohibition from the Mosaic Law. You couldn't, couldn't buy someone out for murder. Exodus 21, 12, and 14, Deuteronomy 19, 11, and 13, 2 Samuel 17, 25, and 2 Samuel 20, 10. <clears throat> Two witnesses were required in any capital case. Numbers 35, 19 through 30, Deuteronomy 17, 6 through 12. Numbers 35, 19 through 30, Deuteronomy 17, 6 through 12. And, of course, that's not practice today, but it should be. If the murderer could not be discovered, the city nearest to the scene of the murder was required to make expiation for the crime committed. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 1 through 9. Now, what that's talking about, if they just find a body out there and they can't figure out what it is, they would literally go out there and measure from the body to the nearest city, and one that was nearest would have to pay the family for their loss. These offenses also were to be punished with death. First of all, striking a parent. If you lived in the Mosaic Law and you hit your parent, you could lose your life for it. Cursing a parent. Kidnapping. Exodus 21, 15 through 17. Deuteronomy 27, 16. Exodus 21, 15 through 17. Deuteronomy 27 through 16. I'll tell you a, a, a quick story about I had a neighbor and her daughter was in high school, teenage years, and she was on the way, I don't know whether it's to school or home from school. I think it was maybe home from school. And she, her, the mother was driving, her, her daughter wasn't lo, uh, old enough to drive, and her daughter started cursing her and literally started beating, at, beating on her while she was driving, cursing and beating her mother at the same time. And her mother, you know, stopped the, pulled the car to a stop and got a hold of her and controlled her because her mother was bigger than her. And her mother was telling me this. And she said, what do you think I should do? I said, well, I'll tell you what God would do, and you all be thankful you're not living under the Mosaic law. I said, what she did was so, in, so horrible that if she lived in the Mosaic law and did that to you, she would surely be executed. For either one, cursing or striking a parent. I said, now I'm not saying that you should do what God would do. And then, of course, it had to go through a trial. It had to go through the whole thing. How much of that is going on today? I think of these people, the kids that are out there rioting, looting, arson, all these things that are doing, and they come home. Their parents have to know what they're doing. Are they, are they afraid to confront their children? And it might be, you know, they're graduated from college, but they're still living at home. 
If you had a child that was out there doing that and you knew they were doing it, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democratic or Republican. It doesn't mean, Republican doesn't mean anything. They're breaking the law. They are, there's, that's a horrible thing to do. Would you let them come home and not say anything to them? Or would you say, get your bags, leave now? I don't think too much of that's happening, by the way, the, the leave now part. Okay, this is the biblical census of murder. When I'm saying census, murder is used in different senses, and these are the way the Bible senses are. First of all, you have to murder, which is a verb. It means to kill intentionally and with premeditation. The Bible makes that very clear. To slaughter people is a noun, and it means the killing of many people. Remember in chapter 34, when the sons of Jacob, Dinah's brothers, went in to, what was that, Shimei, the, the city that was named after the, the guy that raped her? Shechem, that's it, Shechem. And what happened? Killed everybody, all the males anyway. Bloodshed refers to murder. It's a noun, and when it says the shedding of blood resulting in murder, that's a form, our sense of murder there. Murderer is a noun, a person commit, who commits suicide, excuse me, homicide, the unlawful killing of another human being. That's really important. Not all killing is murder, but murder is always unlawful killing. There is killing that is lawful. We'll get to that. Murder, a noun, is the unlawful killing of a human being by another human being. Those are the different senses. And there's even other words like to slay someone means to kill them. But you have to look at the context in those and see if it's talking about murder or kill. Now, the King James Version in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. Many people believe that capital punishment is wrong because they think this verse above prohibits it. But the Hebrew word used in this verse is ratsak. Ratsak. R-A-T-S-H-A-K. And it means murder, not kill. And you can tell that because the New King James Version, Exodus 20, 13, says you shall not murder. New American Standard Version says you shall not murder. So when they say thou shalt not kill, you can say no, it doesn't say that. It says it in the King James, 400, year book, 400 years ago, they, that's what they wrote. But the Hebrew word there means murder. I had someone confront me on that one time. And he had a girlfriend, and she was saying, no, oh, that says kill. You're not supposed to kill anybody. I said, doesn't say kill. It says murder. They didn't believe me, and I brought them up here after church, and I had a, a interlinear. I went to the verse. I said, what does that say right there? Murder. So that's what you have to do for some people. And they graciously said, okay. Proved it to them. You've got to be willing to do that sometimes. Now, capital punishment is a legitimate function of jurisprudence for capital crimes beginning with murder. Under the Mosaic Law, capital punishment is mandated, in, uh, mandated for the following crimes. I'm going to get rid of this in here. Okay, it's mandated for the following crimes. A is murder. Exodus 21.12. We we know that already. Violence against parents. We just read about that. That is in Exodus chapter 21, verse 15. That's just three verses from the one about murder. C is kidnapping. If you go to Exodus 21, starting with verse 12, you're going to be all in the middle of it. Because kidnapping is Exodus 21, 16.
we don't we don't uh execute people for kidnapping, do we? D adultery. Leviticus twenty ten and Deuteronomy twenty two twenty two. This is adultery, Leviticus twenty ten and Deuteronomy twenty two twenty two. Now this was reclined by the Lord Jesus Christ in the case of the adulterous woman. God handles these cases personally now. Remember when the woman was caught, caught in adultery? Well, they were going to take her out and stone her. And Jesus Christ on the spot changed the Mosaic law. Why? By the way, does he have the authority to do that? <laughs> I believe so. Uh, e, rape. Deuteronomy 22, 25. I can remember when I was a boy, let's say seven years old, if there was a rape, it made the news. And I, th I think they were executing them then for rape. It was a big deal. That was a long time ago. Now, there's no telling how many rapes take place every day in this country. And most of the time you don't even hear about it. Unless that is a, a man that's trying to be a justice in the Supreme Court, then it might be accused of being a gang, rape, a gang raper. Gang rapist, I should say. I'm talking about Kavanaugh. F is bestiality. That's ex Exodus 22:19. G is incest, Leviticus 20:11 20, through 12. And the last one here is homosexuality, Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13. I don't see how people who are Christians and they support homosexuality, and the Bible says they, if, if two men are caught in a homosexual act, they are to be executed. I guess they say, well, that was in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's different now. Really? That's the fifth time. Um, I don't know how to get by that. I mean, it's silly. Oh, well, that was in there. Oh, so God would murder people in the, in the Old Testament for homosexuality because it's okay. It had to be murdered if it's okay in the New Testament, right? Ooh, I'm out of time, honey. Capital punishment must be preceded by trial authorized from the judicial function of government. You just can't take people out and hang them like you see in the Westerns. No one would be executed unless there were at least two witnesses. And what they would do is they would interrogate the witnesses, one over here and one over here, not together. And they, would, they knew how to grill them. And if there was discrepancy there, they'd throw out, they'd be thrown out. Crime can't be controlled apart from the proper use of capital punishment because it puts teeth into the law and is the only deterrent for hardened criminals. I'll tell you something. This is what I thought about when I wrote this. About a week ago, I was talking to Rowdy. Y'all know who Rowdy is in prison. And he was telling me about a friend that was getting out in about seven days. And his friend came to him and said, hey, I'm going to be out in about seven days. And he said, uh, but I'll be back probably within a month. He, You're going to be back? What for? He says, well, I'm going to take care of somebody. And he says, well, well, you know, whatever floats your boat. And he says, I was just wondering if you wanted anybody to be taken care of. And Rowdy said, no, I am good. And he says, well, I just want to know. He said, um, uh, uh, because since I'm going to be out and taking care of things, I could take care. He, he really liked Rowdy. And so he said, I asked him, I said, well, you think he's going to do it? He said, yeah, he'll be back in about a month. He's going to go out and kill the people that he has uh, just decided to kill. He's for vendetta or revenge or whatever it is he was in prison for seven years and he's getting out and the first thing he's going to do is go out 
and kill the people that need killing and he'll be back in there. Now the reason I'm telling you this is I, I think the first, uh, he was in for killing somebody or attempted murder or something like that anyway. If you were executed for murder, those people would not have to worry about being killed, would they? That's one thing for sure about capital punishment. They're not going to do it again. But when I said that the capital, cri uh, capital punishment it puts teeth into the law and it's the only deterrent for hardened criminals. He tells me stories you can't believe. They'll stab someone in the neck if they didn't pay them for a pack of cigarettes. And they get stabbings in there about averaging about once a week and maybe once every other week. They're, they're stabbings. And they fly a helicopter in there and they take them to wherever emergency room somewhere and don't know whether they made it or not. So these stupid people that say that capital punishment is wrong, they are wrong. They said, well, it won't bring the, bring the, the, uh, the people back. Well, that's true, but there won't be any more. <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> he won't be killing anybody else. And I'm saying if they knew that to be the case, the same thing for rape. Rape in those prisons are, is unbelievable. Just the stories. Just the... Uh, and I said, if they knew, just, and he says the lifers are the worst. Because what can they do to them? They give the ones in there that have life a wide berth. Because if you cross them, they'll just soon kill you, and so what? What are they going to do to them? They're, not, they're just, they got life anyway. So if they, even if in prison for rape and for murder, if they knew that there was going to be swift and just punishment and they would be executed, Life in prison would be a lot easier. Not that it's, we want it real easy, but it wouldn't be, maybe I should, not easy isn't the right word, it would be less dangerous. Capital punishment also is also to be applied to animals that take human life. I got more to say about that. As, as you can see, I have another, uh, this goes on, but I'm out of time. So there's a lot about murder. You see, we can think about these words. We can draw opinions. I mean, the Bible is just explaining what these sins are about. I mean, not just what, what it means, but the fallout, the consequences, the biblical perspective on these things, and it will help us to make better decisions. Let's close. Father, thank you for this time that we can fellowship in your word. This helps us be in touch with reality. Sometimes we have skewed visions of people being better than they really are. We're not to judge them. We're not to be afraid of them. But we have to be like very diligent people who are as wise as snakes and harmless as doves. And this help us, helps us do this. So we thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.